All right, welcome to Curiosity Not Judgments with Birga and Gary. Glad to have you watching or listening. Happy to see you. So we want to talk about what happens when your good intention gets you judged negatively today. I was at a luncheon, which is why I'm a little bit dressed up today, and it was honoring heroes in the community. And one of the reward award recipients was a woman who serves as a police aide. And there was a situation in our city um, back six or more months ago where there was a, an active shooting and there was a spray of gunfire. Several police officers were hit and this police aide saw that her colleague had been wounded and went to uh, render aid and, and help get him safely out of harm's way. And I remember at the time seeing some chatter online through Facebook or whatever, or maybe it was even the posting of, of the news story itself saying, you know, she shouldn't have been out there. You know, as things tend to go, a heroic action got all kinds of negative co comments associated with it. And I, I'm pleased to say all these months later, she was heralded uh, as a, you know, an a, award winner in our community for the good work that she had done. The gentleman who presented the award was one of the deputy chiefs, and he was probably, I don't know, six feet two. She's probably five feet nothing. And he said something, you know, that today, uh, you know, you are my giant. And I thought it was just very cute and clever. But it made me think about these times when, you know, she jumped into action and she could have gotten herself killed. Mm -hmm. She could have gotten herself wounded. And had that been the case, then, of course, all of the backlash would have been even more ferocious. So let's talk about when you jump in and you do an action that you deem to be right in the moment because you are trying to protect others and you get criticized for it, you get judged for it. How do you correct course? Yeah. And is he, and is correction course even necessary? Right. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think first of all, I would love to think that in the in a situation like that, um, I would jump into action. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we all want to be able to think of themselves as somebody who would jump into action and and help out somebody else in need immediately without even thinking about it. Um, you think about the person in in the situation where Reagan got shot who jumped right mm. in the way of that bullet. I, you know, that's the kind of thing where I think, okay, sure, that person was supposed to do that. You know, he's protecting the president, et cetera. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's his job or her job. But, you know, even if it's not your job or, uh, or even if it is your job, and uh, would you do it? Mm. Would, you, would you step in or would you not do it? So hopefully, you know, we, we like to think that we would do that. But second of all, Oftentimes, when we have determined instant, instantaneously or even after a few seconds that this is the right thing to do, um, and then people judge you for it later, you know, you, it's easy to think, well, you weren't in the situation, you don't know what I've been through, you don't know my background, you don't know all the things that led to this thing, and I acted. And at least I acted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how could you possibly judge that on one, one, one thing? But in this day and age, of course you're going to get judged. Well, and are we hamstringing our public servants, like just in a very critical way, by all of the online posting, and and so are are our frontline defenders afraid to act because of the fear of judgment? Sure. Well, and many states had to enact what's called the Good Samaritan Law, mm. because uh, a citizen who's trying to render aid may screw up. Mm. Uh, you know, when you're doing chest compressions or yeah. on someone or you're, or something's going on, it may go wrong, mm -hmm. but at least you were trying to help. What's mm -hmm. going to be the result otherwise? And we have to pass laws about Good Samaritan laws to say, at least you're trying to help mm -hmm. and we're not going to punish you if something goes wrong. So, um, I think it's, it's important in society that we, that we do jump in and we do help and we do try to do something versus just ignoring it and walking the other way. So that's a state by state situation though, right? The it Good is, Samaritan. I think, so, as far as I know. Yeah, so depending on where you live, I mean, you could, let's use that very example. Somebody uh, loses consciousness in a department store, it is determined that they need to have CPR rendered to them and you are the bystander, you decide to render first aid, uh, you end up breaking a rib, they get a lung punctured, 
they survive, but then they sue you. You know, it's those kinds of stories that I think make people very shy from, uh, or make someone to shy away from being of help. And, mm -hmm. and it, it grieves me that we've gotten to that place in our society. And, you know, even more so what I was asking about our, our frontline defenders, our, our police, et cetera, you know, are they going to be afraid to respond for fear of constantly being filmed and posted online? And it, it it's that fraction of a second decision that now you're having to worry about how is this going to be judged before you're willing to step in and render aid? And, you know, the whole idea of, you know, punishing the many for the sins of a few, I mean, some would say, well, you know, uh, having cell phone cameras at the ready is a good thing. It, it leads to transparency and everybody being held accountable. Um, but I guess the, the held accountable to what standard? Mm. And, uh, and if someone is, is with a good heart or good intent trying to do something well, you know, the old saying, you know, we judge others by their actions and ourselves by our motives or, mm -hmm. or our intentions. And, and I know that I was in a situation just today when uh, I, was, I was judged and I know that I was like, no, 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 I'm really trying to do the right thing here. And this work colleague thought that I was judging them or putting myself above them or whatever by doing this and I'm going well I know what I'm trying to do here and you know how dare you judge me for that and and uh but I mean and it all worked out and I was able to explain this the situation but how often do we not get the chance to explain or how often is someone going to judge and they don't care about our explanation mm. uh and 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 it's it, it's 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 tough you know what does it cause us not to act does it cause us not to do the right thing, uh, whether we're a police officer or whether we're uh, just a, a citizen in the situation or in work situations? Mm -hmm. How often do we not stand up for a colleague mm -hmm. when it's the right thing to do when we think we're going to be judged? Mm -hmm. And what do we do in those situations? You know, I think this goes down a, a long psychology path, right? I mean, this is something that's probably been studied for a hundred plus years about group think, how do we respond in these various situations? This reminds me of a, of a story that my sister-in-law shared with me a number of years ago about a, an experiment that happened in a high school setting where there was a tray presented to the students. You had eight or 10 items on the tray and I think they were shown this tray in groups. So, you know, group A, group B. Um, and I think they had identical items. And the, the, the presenter said something like, okay, list all the items on the tray. And there was a plant in the group that said, oh, well, there was a, a red ball on the tray when there never was. And one by one, everybody in these groups said, oh, oh yeah, yeah, there was a red ball. They, they had misremembered that there was a red ball. And my sister-in-law, just in the way that she's watched, she's like, no, there was no red ball in that tray. You know, at the end of the experiment, the, the person says, you know, you were the one person that was willing to stand on the, the truth and not give in to this peer pressure groupthink mentality. And so it just, these kinds of things make me wonder, you know, how would I respond in a situation where you've got the vast majority of people saying very boldly a very you know, forward judgmental statement, like this is the truth, this is the way, you know it's not, but are you gonna capitulate because of fear of judgment? Mm -hmm. Fear of judgment, and I think that um, we could all, um, again, when you're not in the battle, it's different than when you're not in, and then the question then comes, why are you, why are you battling? Right. Um, I think your, your sister gives us a good example of uh, of, of saying, you know, no, that's not what I saw. Now, how you say it, mm. we could discuss. You guys are all wrong and you must be being manipulated mm. or uh, you are all in group think or is probably not the most useful approach. Mm. You can absolutely say, I never saw a red ball. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a red ball there, but hey, if you guys all saw one, and you want to write down that there's a red ball there in my life, that's not a consequence. Mm. And so, uh, but I, I'm going to just stand by my perception that there was never a red ball there. Mm. But if you guys all need to go down the path of saying there's a red ball there, you go for it. You know, I, and, and, but 
But is that too wimpy of a response? Mm. Should I say, no, the truth is there was no red ball there. My problem is if everybody in the group is saying there was a red ball there, I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I missed it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and do I want to stand and die on the, on the rock of there was a red ball there right. when it really has no consequence in my life? Right. But let's translate this to the work world because we, you know, I think we have a lot of folks who watch this that this is a, a real practical situation that they may experience in their work setting. So if you're on a team of folks and, you know, you have a, a point that you know to be correct and it's contrary to what the rest of the group is expressing how do we do it and I, I think maybe you've just asked the key question is this a hill worth dying on right whatever that issue is and you want to stand in integrity you want to stand for the truth you want to stand for all of the right reasons but is it worth dying on the hill dying on is the yeah and and or is this something that is going to be useful to the group dynamic going forward the next time you're making a decision or the next mm -hmm. time you have to work together um because i think that you know, there are, I mean, God, I, a classic example is my sister and I will be talking about the same thing that happened when we were both, you know, 10, 12 years old or whatever. And uh, she will remember it completely different okay. than I do. Um, you know, who's right, who's wrong? Does it matter? We, we, we've gotten to the point where we laugh about those things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not the way I remember it. I remember this, this, and this. Oh my goodness, you're kidding. Well, this, this is what happened. Really? Okay, so we now know that we would just <laughs> agree to disagree, that we both in remember and interpret, which is part of the remembering, uh, um, things totally different. It's like the, the old, you know, parable about the, the, you know, four blind men that are on an elephant, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all right. One person says this is like a tree because he's on the leg. And the other person says this is like a snake because they're on the, the, the trunk. And, uh, and it's like, okay, we can all be right. Mm. It, this can be an and, not an or. Mm. And I think that that's a, an important thing to remember. But let's take it to where you're, I think you're going, and that is if, if it's an important decision and uh, you've got three people that say, no, we've got to go this way because of this, this, and this. And I think that, that that's the important part, this, this, and this. Because usually decisions come from a ladder of inference or a group of assumptions or a group of uh, data, hopefully, that have led people to a certain decision. Investigating that and saying, okay, how'd you get there? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you if you got there by this, it's, it's worth examining. Oh, wait, 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 when you said this, I don't remember it that way. I remember it this way. That would lead you to a different conclusion so let's discuss that mm -hmm. uh, because it's important for how we got there. You know, like I said, it's, there's, there's rarely one right answer. There's usually a couple of right answers or a couple of different ways to get to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So assuming that the issue at hand is one of integrity and one that is really going to have a, a consequence upon somebody else. I'm thinking about you're in a group meeting, a group setting, when something is said about a colleague that is detrimental or said uh, something that is just completely inaccurate that needs to be corrected. There's that moment of hesitation be between do I self-preserve or do I stand and defend? And how, how you make that calculation in your head in real time is probably just as uh, ind individual as the person that is experiencing the situation, mm -hmm. but there are going to be those you know hills worth dying on, uh, in terms of protecting somebody who isn't present to do or say something for themselves, or is present and just doesn't have the power to defend. Well, now you've brought up a whole another thing, which is the definition of gossip, mm. right? Um, and Stephen Covey, there's been a few people who who've talked about this. I remember Dave Ramsey ha has a company that does, um, you know, a company about budgeting and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and he has a, uh, a policy in his company that, you know, there is no gossip. And he, he has a definition of gossip, which is 
quite interesting. It, it, it's, it involves is the person here, but it involves more than that. It's uh, if we're going to discuss something, is this something we can do something about? Mm. Which I think is also an interesting part mm -hmm. of things. Uh, but anyway, the point is, uh, let's just take Covey's definition, uh, which is it's fairly uncontroversial. Um, I say that in this day and age. That says that basically, if somebody's not there in the room, um, you know, should you be talking about the, that person? And his technique, which I always really liked, is if somebody starts talking about somebody who's not there, you say, hmm, you make an interesting point. Let's go talk to them about that, mm. which usually kills it right away. Right. It's like, oh, I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want to talk about them. Mm. Um, but let's go back to what you were saying, which is, okay, this is something that's about another person that's derogatory, um, and you think it's not true, or you know that the event didn't happen that way. Um, should you defend that person? Or... If it's a group of people, maybe they're just happy talking about somebody else and you defending that person could put your standing with the group at jeopardy. Mm -hmm. In that situation, I, I kind of have to lean towards defending the person, you know, even, even if it puts yourself at jeopardy. Because here's the thing. If you've got three people saying derogatory things about someone who are not, that, that's not true or isn't necessary... You know what's going to happen when you're not in the room? Yeah, same thing about you. They're going to be talking about you that way. So I think it's important to stand up and mm -hmm. say, you know, that's not a, it's not appropriate. Um, let's either go talk to that person about that if you think it's true. Um, or, you know, let's turn the conversation to something more useful. Mm -hmm. Because how is that helping the situation? Because dividing people in a group, especially a team that's supposed to be performing at work in a nonprofit, in a governmental situation. How is that helpful? Yeah. All right. So what if the person uh, that's being complained about and gossiped about is the boss? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, uh, I guess the, the, the situation there is, is it true? And if it's true, why aren't we addressing it with the boss mm. or with the boss in the room? And um, one could say, well, it's the boss. And so we can't talk about it. We can't address it with the boss. Okay, having been a boss, I'd rather know. Uh, I would rather know that this is being thought about me, especially said about me. I don't want people tattling, but I would like to hear from the group if I've got a defect or, a, a, or something that's going wrong or, or a blind spot, especially, which is usually the case, right? Um, I, I'm, I, am, I usually don't intentionally harm the group or the company that I'm working with or for. Um, I usually am trying to do the right thing by that company and by that group. And so if I've got a blind spot, I want to know. So please tell me. Now, not all bosses feel that way. I right. get it. You're more self-aware than most. But but let's just put that aside for a second. I think the I think the, the right thing to do is to think, especially if this is something that we really do believe is hurting either the company or the team. Mm. That ha we have to say something about that. And saying something about it, choosing a time and a place and an environment uh, uh, where that person can hear it. Mm. is important but not mandatory i mean that maybe that environment never exists yeah. maybe you feel like that person would never be in a good situation to hear that it's got to be said mm. it's got to be said by someone i have been in situations where someone will say okay gary they'll probably hear it better from you would mm. you please be our emissary and go address this but at least that at least the team is saying it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So I give that a lot of credit, even if some people are feel like they're they're in a weaker position or a more strong position to address it. At least we're talking about being addressed. Yeah. You know, I, I am a very relational person, and if there is a frustration in communication, I so much want to say, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. Let's do some of the get-to-know-you stuff. But unfortunately, because of the way so much of our modern world is structured post, well, are we post pandemic? At, at the tail end of the pandemic. I'm calling it, we are. 
it's all <laughs> virtual. And, yeah. you know, I am in a situation where I work with people I have never been face to face with ever and may not ever be face to face with. And it's a bizarre concept to try to navigate relationship with somebody completely in a digital environment. We have hired a new person in our company right now uh, who I've never met. And uh, she's been here now, I want to say six weeks. And um, we were trying to make a decision today as to who should be at a certain meeting. And one of my decision criteria was I'm going to go because I've never met this person face to face mm -hmm. and I need to. Yeah. Uh, they're a critical part of the team and I need to go and break bread with that person because uh, there's absolutely no question in my mind from my experience that uh, once you have a meal with a person, once you get to know a person face to face, it helps the, the relationship. Absolutely. And if you're if you're listening to hear rather than listening to respond, especially in those opportunities where it's a get to know you environment, you pick up on so much that really is applicable to later conversations and or gives you some insight into with that person's having a real snippy bad day. Maybe you know like, oh, I remember hearing that there was some issues with a, a sick child or oh, I remember hearing that, you know, that person had uh, been in a car accident. Maybe there's some residual pain or I, I, I was making stuff up. But there is so much value in getting to know a little bit of the, the person behind the individual that you're talking to on the screen. And so I know we've had conversations about this in past episodes, but just the necessity in whatever way we can make it happen to try to get to know the person and not just the, you know, the avatar on the screen. Just today, uh, I had a person complaining that someone wasn't responsive uh, to their last email. And I had just gotten off the phone with the person. And the fact of the matter was that their wife who has MS had fallen and broken her ankle. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're having to redo their entire uh, master bedroom and uh, hallway and living room with uh, helps uh, for uh, things to accommodate mm -hmm. what is going to be a, 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 a battle, um, you know, for the rest of their lives. And, you know, uh, when you have that knowledge, you're, you're, you can give grace. Now, the, yeah. the question that should immediately follow, and it does in my mind, is why wasn't I willing to give grace before I knew mm -hmm. that situation? Um, you know, most people are trying to do the best they can. Mm -hmm. Most people. And, uh, and, and if we come in with that assumption, things tend to go a lot better than if we have the assumption that this person just doesn't want to do it. Uh, they're trying to mess up the group. Uh, they really have no motivation to uh, to do the right thing with respect to this group, this company, this nonprofit, this government agency. Um, I, I, I try. I'm not successful all the time to give the person the benefit of the doubt and some grace, not knowing where that person is on their journey. Yeah, I readily admit I could do much better with that, but I often get frustrated with lack of response or lack of professionalism, whatever it is that I deem to be the front facing behavior not knowing any of the backstory, you know, even as deep into this journey as you and I both are, I, I fail at this on a daily basis. And so I want to be more conscientious about that. And sure. what we can do also is to talk, to talk to people about stuff that's going on in our lives. Sometimes, and I fall prey to this all the time, I want to put up a brave front. Mm. You know, I don't need help on this. I'm okay. I've got it handled. I can handle anything. Uh, and that's, you know, the way I was raised. And so, so every once in a while, though, I've got to say, you know what? I'm on PTO next week and I have something I can't unwind and it's important for the family. And so I'm not going to be at that meeting. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if there's a backstory or about like what just happened to a friend of mine, a work colleague and a friend um, with their spouse, you know what? Uh, uh, you know, and so I was able to say you know what? They got a lot going on right now. I don't need to divulge the whole thing. Sure. Uh, certainly not the confidence of my friend who's, who feels they wanted to share with me for some advice and help and, and to be able to share it because sometimes that's lonely. Um, but I don't have to say the whole situation. I can just say, you know, they got some stuff going on right now. Uh, you know, give them a break. Uh, give them a little bit of, a, of grace and I'm sure they're going to get back to you soon. So am I hearing you say, lead with curiosity, not judgment? <laughs> exactly. And, and, and curiosity and a bit of grace. Uh, mm -hmm. Curiosity and a little bit of, you know what, uh, let's give somebody the benefit of the doubt.
All right, so we'll coin a new phrase. We'll lead with graciosity. Graciosity, I love it. All right, I think that's a good place to wrap for today. So as always, thank you. Feel free to leave comments and feedback. You can check out the website, curiositynotjudgment.com. And until next time. Take care.